Um, and we're going to hear from uh, my amazing EM colleague at North York General, uh, Dr. Yashi Yathindra. Uh, she's going to enlighten us on one of the most unrecognized problems in our society, the critical events that we often miss in the ED, where we really can change the lives of those suffering for the better. Here's Yashi Yathindra on intimate partner violence. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so honored to be here today, and I want to thank the EMU committee for inviting me to speak about intimate partner violence. This is a heavy topic, and the things I'm going to talk about may be a trigger for some people. So please feel free to step away from the lecture and do what you have to to preserve your well being. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. A few years ago, I was wrapping up a long shift and I picked up my last chart for the day. It was a young woman whose chief complaint on the triage note was tracheal injury. She had tripped and fallen down the stairs and injured the front of her neck. She was having some pain, but her physical exam was relatively normal. She was speaking clearly. There was no difficulty breathing or swallowing. There was no bruising or hematomas of the neck and there was no crepitus in the soft tissues. I was reassuring her that everything was probably okay when she burst into tears. And I knew immediately that I had missed something. I took her into a more private room, closed the door, and asked her if there was anything else I needed to know about her injury. She finally disclosed to me that her ex-boyfriend had come over and strangled her. His thumbs pushed so forcefully over her throat that she felt and heard a crack. A CT of her neck revealed a laryngeal fracture. I chose to tell you about this case because I want you to know that at the time I felt fairly capable of detecting IPV in the emergency department. This near miss was a major reality check and I wondered how many other cases had I missed in the past. I started reading around IPV, but the more I learned, the more it upset me. Every six days, a woman in Canada is murdered by her intimate partner, and women who are strangled are four times more likely to be murdered in the next year. I almost sent my patient home to become another horrible statistic, but my hope is that by talking about IPV today, I can prevent you from doing the same. My objectives for this talk are to convey to you that intimate partner violence is a serious problem and emergency healthcare providers need to do more about it. I also want to give you some practical tips around screening, counseling, and documentation that will help you identify and manage victims of IPV on your next shift. The term intimate partner violence describes physical violence, sexual violence, stalking and psychological harm by a current or former partner or spouse. It can affect anyone, regardless of age, gender, sexual orientation, race, religion, socioeconomic status. It crosses all boundaries. But it's a silent epidemic because we don't think or talk about it to the same degree as other medical problems even though the World Health Organization estimates that one in three women have a lifetime risk of IPV. Intimate partner violence is a long-standing, preventable public health problem and a serious women's health issue. Look at some of these long-term effects of IPV, mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, pregnancy complications, higher rates of STIs, injuries, and deaths. 38% of women murdered globally were murdered by their intimate partner. Newer studies are even showing higher rates of heart disease and diabetes in IPV victims. This is why all healthcare providers need to step up, make some noise and change the way we practice to address IPV. And as emergency physicians and nurses, we need to be the first in line. The emergency department is often where these patients present. Victims of IPV are three times more likely to go to an emergency department than their family doctor because the eMERGE is always open, no appointment is needed, they're unlikely to be recognized by other patients, and the physicians don't have a pre-existing relationship with the abuser. Abusers also prefer their partners to go to an emergency department 
because their partners are less likely to see the same doctor regularly and also less likely to find an ally. A retrospective study published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine showed that 44% of women murdered by their intimate partner had visited an ED within two years of the homicide. 93% of those women had come in at least once with an injury. This presents an opportunity for us to intervene, an opportunity for us to save lives. Unfortunately, we are not very good at detecting IPV in the emergency department. Evidence suggests that we are only detecting about 5% of all IPV cases, which means we are missing 95% of cases. If I told you you were missing 95% of the aortic dissections or PEs that you saw, you would be mortified. And yet IPV is more common than both of these conditions combined, and it can also be lethal. We are missing IPV at an alarming rate, but the question is why? Victims of IPV may initially conceal it due to fear of escalated abuse or shame, but the studies have shown that most women felt they would have disclosed the abuse if the emergency physician had asked. We are missing IPV because we are not asking about IPV. We are not screening for IPV. We are letting these barriers listed here prevent us from screening. Missing IPV has become an unfortunate standard of care in the emergency department, and we can no longer accept this. So let's talk about how we can improve our screening as well as our counseling and documentation. First of all, your threshold for screening and asking about IPV needs to be very low, likely much lower than it is right now. You need to perform selective screening and ask about IPV when there is clinical suspicion. The most worrisome signs of IPV are the same as those of child abuse, stories that keep changing, histories that don't match with the injury, a delay in seeking treatment, injuries in concealed areas and multiple injuries at different stages of healing. Other injuries to be worried about include those of the head, neck, teeth, breasts, abdomen, and genitalia, as well as wounds on the forearm when a patient is in a defensive position. You should also be mindful of unusual behaviors. These are things that make you pause, think twice, maybe make you feel a little bit unsettled, overly attentive or verbally abusive of partners, frequent emergency department visits, or inappropriate affect like my patient displayed. And finally, patients presenting with mental health issues, substance abuse, or unexplained chronic or recurrent conditions should trigger you to think about IPV and to ask about IPV. I know this is a lot, but the key is to think about IPV regularly, especially in populations where it's more prevalent, like women of childbearing age. If you don't think about it, you will never catch it. If it's always on your differential, you're more likely to notice these signs and ask about IPV. After employing this strategy, I have asked about IPV a lot more, and I can assure you that not a single person has gotten upset. When you screen for IPV, the setting needs to be appropriate. The patient has to be alone. So ask any family members to leave or make an excuse and take the patient to a different area of the department. Make sure you're in a room with a closed door for privacy. Then make a direct inquiry based on your clinical suspicion. I see some bruising on your neck. How did that happen? If IPV is not disclosed, proceed to a screening tool. There is no gold standard screening tool for IPV, but the one that's used most commonly in emergency departments is the partner violence screen. I would encourage all of you to commit a tool like this to memory and practice it on your shifts. However, if you can't remember these particular questions in the moment, don't let that be a barrier for screening. The common themes within all of these tools revolve around harm and safety. So ask about those in a simple way because it's better than not asking at all. In addition to active selective screening, your emergency department can employ a passive strategy as an adjunct. Dr. Carrie Samsel is an emergency physician at the Ottawa Hospital and the medical director of the Sexual Assault and Partner Abuse Care Program. 
She and her team developed this silent screening poster to be placed in emergency department washrooms. It allows victims of IPV to discreetly place a green sticker on their urine bottle, which would then be identified by the nurses. This is a simple strategy with huge potential to help people. If your screen is negative, the time and effort spent screening is never wasted. The patient may have chosen not to disclose IPV to you this time around, but it lets them know that this emergency department is a safe place and somewhere they will be supported when they do need help. If your screen is positive and IPV is disclosed, the next step is counseling. There is no perfect structure to this part of the process, but there are some key concepts that are important. The first words out of your mouth need to be compassionate and used to support the victim. Think about what you would say to a close friend if they told you they were a victim of IPV. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. You deserve to be treated with respect. No one should be hurt by their partner. Ask the victim if they feel safe going home and assess the safety of any children in the home. In Ontario, there is no mandatory duty to report adult victims of IPV to the police. However, if children under 16 are being abused or they witness the abuse in the home, that needs to be reported to the Children's Aid Society. For those of you outside of Ontario, please familiarize yourself with your local laws. Ask the victim if they've thought about what they're going to do next and if they want your help. Their decisions are going to be made on a number of complex factors and they need to be respected. It is not your job to convince the patient to report the abuse to the police or to convince them to leave their abusive partner. In fact, violence often escalates and victims face the highest risk of murder when attempting to end the relationship. So it may not be in their best interest to leave when they're not ready. For all victims who want help, whether they're going home to the abusive partner or not, you need to create a safety plan as well as provide them with resources. This is something a social worker can definitely help you with, but you need to know how to do it on your own in case one isn't available. You should also encourage all victims to go to a sexual assault and domestic violence treatment center or the equivalent specialized center in your area. This is for further counseling, proper assault and injury documentation and forensic evidence collection. They need to know that this is not the same thing as contacting the police and forensic evidence can be collected and stored for up to six months and will only be released to the police if the victim consents to do so. This is an example of a simple safety plan that I make with my patients who are going home to their abusive partner. I ask them to consider a safe way out of the home and a safe place to go in case violence escalates. A safe way out includes avoiding rooms with weapons like the kitchen, as well as hard surfaces where they're at increased risk of injury like washrooms. They should also pack an emergency bag in advance and keep it somewhere hidden in the home or in someone else's home. This should contain things like important documents, keys, cash, and contact numbers. They also need to know to call the police if they're in immediate danger, and they should have a signal with any older children in the home to do the same. A safe place to go could be a family or friend's home or a local shelter, and they have to know how to get to these places if they don't have access to a car. They should also deactivate the GPS on their phone so that the abuser can't find them. Providing resources is also an important part of safety planning. This will vary depending on your location, so please talk to your social workers and Google domestic violence services and your location. For those of you in Ontario, you need to know about the Ontario Network of Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Treatment Centers, which is what I talked about earlier. You also need to know about the Assaulted Women's Helpline, which runs 24-7 and provides service in over 200 languages. Despite the name, it does provide service to all victims of abuse, including males, as well as patients who identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. It will help victims with safety planning, counseling, therapy referrals, legal resources, and a lot more. In terms of documentation, the medical record will become incredibly important if the victim decides to pursue legal options. 
Doctors, however, are notorious for their bad handwriting, so please, please write legibly and dictate if possible. Chart promptly and don't assume anything. Use the patient's words to describe the abuse. This will ensure consistency between the medical record and the police statement. Choose your words carefully. Patient claims, denies, or alleges may suggest that you don't believe the patient. Use patient states or reports instead. When documenting the physical exam, refrain from using the common phrase, patient well, no acute distress. This is not reflective of how the patient is actually feeling and may be used against them in the future. Document all of your physical examination findings in detail and sketch the injuries if possible. And the final discharge diagnosis should be intimate partner violence or domestic violence. Now more than ever, the emergency department is crucial for victims of IPV. Stay-at-home orders during the COVID-19 pandemic have trapped victims with their abusers. Many victims are unable to safely connect with services. Job losses and unemployment have exacerbated financial entanglement, which is a major barrier for victims to leave their abusive partners. Closures of schools and childcare facilities have increased stress at home, and family physicians moving to telemedicine platforms has made safely screening for IPV more difficult as abusers are able to listen in on conversations. The emergency department may be the only safe place a victim of IPV can go, so we need to be on high alert for signs of violence. I hope that I've conveyed to you today that intimate partner violence is a critical emergency medicine issue and we need to do better. Think about it often, have a low threshold to screen for it, practice and work on your counseling, know your local resources and document accurately and legibly. Be a champion in your department, educate yourself and educate those around you. And I guarantee you, you will help thousands of people. Let's not let this silent epidemic rage on any longer. Thank you. All right, great talk. That was really interesting. Uh, the analogy with uh, aortic dissection and and uh, int intimate par partner violence that really kind of drives home the point very well. Um, before we get into some questions for Dr. Yathindra, just thank you to everyone for participating in the chat. There's some great questions and discussions there, a nice community feel. Um, you know, there were so many practical practical pearls in the, in the talk. Um, let's talk about universal screening for IPV versus selective screening. What's the difference between universal screening and selective screening and, and which one should we be doing? Thanks for asking that, Anton. It's something I actually wanted to discuss in my presentation, but with the lack of time that we weren't able to. Um, universal screening is basically asking everyone who comes through the emergency department, regardless of their presentation, about IPV. Um, and a lot of you know groups are advocating for universal screening, especially in populations like women of childbearing age, where you know IPV is more prevalent. And uh, this can be done in a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be done by the physician. If you're asking everyone who comes in, um, you can do it through you know a computer kiosk. You can do it at triage. You can do it with the second nursing assessment, or the physician can do it themselves. And so the theory behind it is that the more people you ask, the more IPV you will detect, and actually you know, like the more people or victims you will help um, in the future. Unfortunately, um, the evidence is sort of mixed, um, and more recent studies that have been done are not, they don't show sort of improved um, patient outcomes. And so because of that, um, it hasn't really been endorsed by, you know, a number of different groups. And so right now, the minimum that we should be doing is effective selective screening. Um, and that means really sort of taking an interest in educating yourself and knowing what to look for and making sure that you ask about um, IPV in these settings in the emergency department. And that makes it sort of um, really, it, the patient feels more comfortable. Um, they know that you care for them. It's not just sort of a checklist, you know, from a box that, that you know, in universal screening is if you sort of ask, um, you know, or do you smoke? Do you drink? Have you been abused by your partner? It just seems a little bit less personal. 
And so I think, you know, selective screening right now is the way we should be doing things. And in the future, that might change and it might go back to universal screening. But right now, you know, targeted screening is probably the way to go. Yeah. You know, the way you said, you know, do you smoke? Do you have hypertension? Have you had intimate partner violence? I mean, that's how how not to get an answer. How, how do you like, give me an example of when you're actually with a patient, uh, what do you say to kind of make it easier for them to open up to you? So I think if I'm suspecting it, you know, I really do use that in the conversation. So, um, you know, going back to the case that I talked about, um, when she became quite emotional and it seemed odd, that's when I realized and I brought her into her room and I said to her, like, you know, it's obvious that something is upsetting you. Um, did something else happen that I need to know about? And so you kind of use that suspicion and it shows the patient that you care and that you actually are listening to them. And there's something about that situation that is odd um, and you want to know more. And I think that's really effective. Mm -hmm. um, let's move a little bit, sort of like once you've identified uh, intimate partner violence, I find that victims of intimate partner violence rarely want to report abuse to the police. And as you, as you say in your talk, reporting to the police might actually escalate the violence. It actually might result in murder. You don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about how you navigate the situation where you kind of feel like they should report to the police, but they don't want to, or maybe they do want to report to the police, but you worry that that might escalate the violence? Like, how do you kind of navigate the whole reporting to police situation? Um, so I think it's important to realize as eMERGE docs, like we want to fix things, right? Like that's what we do. We fix things in the emergency department. Unfortunately, with intimate partner violence and these patients that are coming in, having experienced all of these problems, this is not something we're going to fix today. Um, hopefully it will be better in the future, but we're not going to fix the problem today. Patients who are victims of IPV will face risks if they go home to their abusive partner, and they will face risks if they potentially leave or report to the police. And so we really need to listen to what they want. We can provide some options, but we have to respect their decision. And if they decide they want to go home, even though we are worried about that situation, um, the only thing that we can do is really provide as many resources as possible get them a great safety plan. And I talked about this in my in my presentation, but really encourage them to go to a specialized treatment center. Um, and this is where they will get amazing counseling, tons more resources, they can be followed up at this site. And that's probably much better than anything you can do in the emergency department. So I really feel like you have to respect the patient's decision, but make sure they're going to be as safe as possible in their situation. All right, one last question before uh, we move on. Uh, some of these patients will have serious injuries. Some of them will have minor injuries. How do you treat the injuries differently in the case of IVP compared to, you know, if someone breaks their wrist from falling off a skateboard um, or if they break their wrist from I I IPV? How, how are you going to treat that broken wrist differently? So you actually don't treat it differently. So the medical management is the same for IPV victims as it is for anyone else who walks through the door. So if they come in with a laceration, you know, sew up the laceration or irrigate and sew it out as sew it up as you normally would. If they come in with a broken bone, you know, do what you need to do. Um, so the management is not any different. The the issue is that you need to document properly and just make sure that you are accurately documenting everything and then have them follow up in the sexual assault and domestic violence treatment center after they have been medically cleared. Now the question comes if there's like an injury that you're not sure if you should touch so something maybe in the perineum or in the vagina or something you know a sexual assault case that's when you really want to get some more advice before you do anything. So, you know, you would talk to your sexual assault and domestic violence treatment center or your specialized center and ask them for advice. They may be able to get a mobile team out to your site and that, you know, may not generally happen. Um, but if you call and ask, they may be able to do that. Or they may be able to um, give you some further advice, like collect the underwear and keep that so that we can test it later. Um, so, Either way, just treat the injuries, make sure they're medically cleared. And if you need any advice, uh, contact the Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Treatment Center. Great advice. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Yathindra. Uh, we're going to move on.